So in the last few videos, we've been talking about the theory for PN junctions and PN junction diodes. In this video, we're going to do a PN junction diode example. And I'm going to show you how just how I work through these kind of problems and why I think they're important to do. So the primary reason examples are important to do is to actually get comfortable with the math. So we want to get comfortable with, with the units in particular uh, and with doing quick uh, unit checks when it's feasible to do so. And generally it will be, because uh, enough stuff is gonna cancel out that that'll be straight, fairly straightforward to do. And we also just wanna get comfortable plugging stuff into a calculator. So we wanna get comfortable with our calculator. Uh, I have a TI Inspire, a uh, fantastic calculator. I'm not getting paid to say that, I promise. I'm just kind of in love with it. Um, Unfortunately, it's banned on almost all exams. So for this problem, uh, we're going to, the problem is uh, calculate the reverse saturation current density of a PN junction diode with the following parameters. And the parameters are as follows. So we've got uh, Na, uh, which is the doping concentration on the P side, which is equal to Nd, uh, which is 10 to the 16 per centimeter cubed. Uh, Dn, the diffusion coefficient for electrons, is 25 centimeter squared per second. Uh, Dp is 10 centimeter squared per second. Um, the intrinsic carrier concentration, and this is a number that you should memorize uh, for, for silicon, 1.5 times 10 to the 10 per centimeter cubed. Uh, the tau P and tau N uh, are both the same and they're equal to five times 10 to the minus seven seconds. And uh, so we're going to try and find the reverse saturation current density JSAT. Uh, so how do we do this? Well, we know that JSAT is just equal to two components, uh, JNSAT plus JPSAT. Uh, and we always want to start out with the simplest possible formulas, and then we'll break them down piece by piece, and then we'll sort of work backwards uh, to actually find ourselves an answer. And we'll be checking at each point to see if the answer seems reasonable. So we know that the reverse saturation current density for electrons uh, is just Q times dn times np naught, uh, where np naught is the electron concentration on the p side at equilibrium, all divided by ln. Now we know dn, uh, we know Q, we know we know dn. Uh, we need to find np naught and we need to find ln. So remember that ln was actually just a measure that we used for convenience last time because we said that the product dp or dn in this case uh, dn times tau n must have units of length squared and so we just called that product uh, ln the diffusion length uh, and so ln or rather the square of the diffusion length so ln is just the square root of dn times tau n and so we're going to calculate that first because these are these are both given. And so if we calculate dn times tau n, that's 25 centimeters squared per second times tau n, which is uh, 5 times 10 to the minus 7 seconds. And we pull out our calculator. And uh, you can't see me, but I promise I am typing this into my calculator as we speak. Uh, 5 times 10 to the minus 7 times 1. Uh, so we get 3.54 uh, times 10 to the minus 3. And the units are the most important part of semiconductor physics because you're going to be dealing a lot with units that will probably make you uncomfortable, uh, like centimeters, for example. Almost everything is given in centimeters in semiconductor physics. And I'm not sure if that's just from the semiconductor physicist tendency to use the CGS system instead of the MKS system, but that's that's where we're at. So we got to get comfortable with those units. So 
we know that the seconds will cancel the seconds and centimeters squared taking the square root we're left with just raw centimeters. And when I'm doing these problems, I leave everything in centimeters. I don't convert it back into meters uh, because when we plug stuff in at the very end, a lot of centimeters will cancel and it's much, uh, much more difficult to make an error if we don't constantly do unit conversions. Okay, so we now have the quantity ln. Now we just need to solve for np naught. Uh, and we know that NP naught is just equal to NN naught uh, times e to the minus VBI over phi T. And NN naught we, we know is just approximately equal to the doping concentration because it's just the electron concentration on the N side, which is the doping concentration if we've got total ionization. Uh, and we know that VBI uh, is just equal to the thermal voltage phi T times the natural log of Na times Nd over Ni squared. And so uh, a, useful, a useful formula here, and another useful thing to memorize is that phi T at room temperature uh, is 25.9 millivolts. It's in units of volts, but I, I put it in uh, millivolts, 0. 0.0259 volts. And if you want phi T as a function of temperature, uh, that's actually really easy. You don't have to memorize Boltzmann, Boltzmann's constant anymore. Uh, you just memorize it at t equals 300, and you say it's 25.9 times t over 300. So you cheat. Uh, I actually do that a lot in semiconductor physics uh, because there's certain quantities that you can memorize and then plug those into a variety of other equations. So if we calculate VBI, uh, that's just phi t times natural log, so 0.02 five nine times the natural log of Na and Nd are both 10 to the 16. So that's 10 to the 16 times 10 to the 16. And then Ni is 1.5 times 10 to the 10. Uh, that's a quantity I recommend you memorize because it's going to come up a lot. Um, 1.5 times 10 to the 10 squared. And so the result is uh, for VBI, is 0 0.695 volts. And does that sound reasonable? Yeah, that does sound reasonable because we know that the uh, typical turn on voltage of a diode is 0.7 volts. So we expect uh, a diode once you apply, um, this is a battery here, once you apply 0.7 volts to a diode, you should start to see appreciable current. So the built in potential we'd expect to be near that. Um, if we got, for example, 10 volts, that would be unreasonable and we should go back and check our calculation. Um, okay, so we now have VBI, so we can calculate NP naught. So if we bring this guy down here, um, that's just NN naught, which is ND, uh, which is 10 to the 16 per centimeter cubed times E to the minus, uh, VBI is 0.695 and phi t is 0 0.0259, and the units of these cancel volts with volts. It's very, very important to always check that your units cancel. So let's plug in 10 to the 16 times e to the minus, uh, that is 0 0.695 divided by 0 0.0259, and we'll end up with, uh, that's equal to 2.2 times 10 to the four. Uh, per centimeter cubed. Now, does this sound reasonable? Uh, well, yeah, it, it sounds pretty reasonable. This is the minority carrier concentration after all. Uh, and if the majority carrier concentration is like 10 to the 16, then we want, and we know our n naught p naught product uh, is just equal to ni squared, which is about 10 to the 20 then the answer should be about 10 to the four because 10 to the 16 times 10 to the four is 10 to the 20. So that's this is a reasonable answer. So we're, do, we're doing good. Uh, now all we need to do is plug each of, the, each of those values in. So Q, uh, a quantity I also recommend you memorize, just 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 uh, coulombs times DN, which we said was, uh, let's check up here real quick, uh, 25 centimeters squared per second. 
uh, times NP naught, which was 2.2 times 10 to the four per centimeter cubed, div all divided by the diffusion length, which we said was 3.54 times 10 to the minus three centimeters. Uh, and now we want to make sure that the units cancel appropriately. So we see we've got a centimeter to the minus three here, uh, which cancels with centimeters to the minus two and leaves a centimeter to the minus one. And that centimeter to the minus one and this centimeter to the minus one give us a centimeter to the minus two. And so this Coulombs becomes, uh, that doesn't get touched, the seconds doesn't get touched. So our answer is Coulombs per second uh, times centimeter to the minus two. And this is Coulombs per second is nothing but our current, uh, so units of amperes, and that's per area. So perfect, uh, that's, those are the units that we expect. So we think that we did the problem correctly. Now let's see what we end up getting for the final answer. So let's plug everything in. Uh, so 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 times 25. And note that I'm not doing any conversions from meters uh, or from centimeters to meters. I'm just using centimeters as my final units. Uh, so times 2.4 times 10 to the four all divided by 3.54 times 10 to the minus three. Up with a grand total of 2.49 times 10 to the minus 11 uh, amperes per centimeter squared. And that might sound a little small, but remember that, that this is the reverse saturation current. It's supposed to be tiny. Um, so this is actually a, a pretty typical answer that, that you'd get for this kind of problem. Uh, and so we've only calculated JN, uh, but you can also calculate JP, and it's ex exactly the same process as I did before. I'm not going to redo it just to save time here. Uh, but if you do the calculation, you'll get that JP is 1.61 uh, times 10 to the minus 11 amperes per centimeter squared. And then to get the total reverse saturation current density, you just add the two, uh, J total or J sat. Um, I just write total because that's how I think of things. It's just JN sat plus JP sat. Oh, JN sat plus JP sat. Uh, and that ends up being equal to 4.16. Uh, and that, that is a four, I promise, times 10 to the minus 11 amperes per centimeter squared. And so that's our final answer. And we do want to leave it in terms of centimeters, uh, generally because that's the, that tends to be a more relevant quantity because these devices are on the scale of microns to centimeters. So they're, they're never good. You're never going to have a one meter long diode. That's just physically not possible. And so uh, that concludes this example. Um, this is how I typically go about solving problems. Um, I always check the units uh, essentially first when I'm doing one of these problems before I actually do all of the multiplication. And at every step, I try to break it down into as many steps as possible. And at every step I check, is this result reasonable? Is this what I would expect? Uh, because there's nothing worse than uh, getting a final result and having no idea whether it should be reasonable or not, or getting a final result that's clearly nonsense and having no idea why. So I find that this uh, approach of breaking things down into smaller pieces and then m putting them all back together at the very end uh, has, has tended to, to work well for, for me, and I would, I would recommend it. So uh, thanks for watching this video. If you have any questions or comments, please post them down below, and uh, I'll see you next time. Thanks.